welcome to another episode of The Hump with Katie. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau, and I've got a great episode for you today with the amazingly talented bassist, Scott Colley. If you're new to The Hump, this is a series where I'm interviewing some of the world's greatest and most talented artists to find out why are they so amazing, how did it happen, really what was their story, and ultimately, what can we learn from them? We've already had some fantastic interviews like Carlos Enriquez, Larry Grenadier, Rufus Reed, Kemp Poplowski, and so many others. You can listen to all of these episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and you can actually go watch them on YouTube. So go like, subscribe, download, and hey, tell me who you want to hear from next. Before I bring you today's episode, I gotta give a shout out to our amazing sponsors. And first up, we have the clothing company, Jams World. You all know how much I love Jams World. It's a clothing company that's been family owned and operated in Honolulu since 1964. And for me, comfort is king. When I'm out there performing or even around my house, I run hot. And I know that Jams World clothing is gonna keep me cool and comfortable because it's made from 100% spun crushed rayon. And the artwork is fantastic. It's real artwork that's screen printed right onto the fabric. It's absolutely amazing. Go to jamsworld.com and use the promo code JAZZ15 and you'll get 15% off your entire purchase. That's jamsworld.com. Up next is Colstein. You guys, I absolutely love Colstein String Shop. It's really my favorite shop in the entire world, and they have an amazing online store. They have two locations in Long Island, New York, and if you go in there, they're totally knowledgeable, helpful, and kind. It's a really great atmosphere. If you go to colstein.com, you'll get 10% off your entire online purchase. That's colstein.com. Our guest today is the bassist Scott Colley. I'm so excited to bring you our guest today because they are also an Angelino. If you don't know what that means, it just means someone who is really from Los Angeles. I mean, like, born and raised in Los Angeles. And the number one word that comes to mind for me when I think of someone like Scott is clarity. When I hear him live or on recording, it is clear as day. I hear every single note as I think he intends it to be, and the melodicism in his bass lines, in the lyricism in his soloing, it's just, it's out of this world, and he is an amazing accompanist. I just love hearing him, and you're going to hear us talk about that today, how he really loves to collaborate and play with other musicians and feed off of their energy. Without further ado, here is Scott Colley. Hey, Katie. Hey, Scott. <laughs> I had to get my head to wake up my speakers. Oh, I, how are you? I'm good. I, we've we've all been through that. <laughs> it's the, the the thing that we do now. Yeah, I know more than ever. It's I'm always just asking people, can you hear me? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, thanks Scott for taking the time. This is great. Of course, thanks for having me. I'm happy to know that that's a real room you have because I saw a video recently or a photo, and I'm like, oh. I wonder if that was a, an elaborate green screen. It is my real room. Yeah, it's actually I get since the era of Zoom pandemic situation, I get a lot of questions about my room. And it was painted by a local artist mm -hmm. who instead of just painting it in an hour like everyone else would do, he just he would paint it and then he would sand so that you can see the grain. That's oh, so that's. Amazing. That's not wood, or is it wood? It is wood. Oh, okay. But he, he kind of elaborately would paint on, and then before it would dry, he would sand it. It, it was... <laughs> and you're like, I just want my room. <laughs> no, I love it. I kind of stare at the grain. Oh, you know. Well, that's awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for joining me, Scott. This is really a pleasure. Of course. To be speaking to a, a fellow Angelino, even though I think you've, you're done with that. I'm not done. I'm. I will always be from Los Angeles. Oh, good. But uh, yeah, it's it's been almost thirty years since I've lived there. Yeah, I know. It's like yeah. you definitely left a trace here. You left a footprint for sure. Oh, nice. Um, I I kind of start off asking everybody. I know this the the name of my series, the hump, is a little. Um, some people who don't know about the bass are like, whoa, what do you mean by that? But what does that mean something to you? You know, in terms of music. Um, I, I, just in terms of, of groove and how some, uh, vaguely, yeah, okay. I, it's, it's not a term that I'm, I was that familiar with, but I have, have heard it and it's, uh, I kind of relate it to how the, uh, to a pocket and how mm -hmm. it fits in that way. I'm just trying to verify that I'm not some like pervert out there, you know, I didn't take it that way. No. Okay, cool. Um, so I, I want to get 
I would definitely want to talk about growing up in Los Angeles because that's very interesting to me. But I mean, you are the bass player's bass player. You're you've been on over 200 recordings, and I was trying to count how many of your own projects you had, and I I got up to 11 of just things released under your own name. Maybe that's not even enough. Um, and the fact that you've played from from Carmen McRae to Clifford Jordan, then everything in between, Dizzy Gillespie, Herbie Hancock, Pat Messini, John Schofield, I can just keep naming names forever. Uh, but it's just, it's amazing what you've, what you've done and what you've contributed to music. So I'm excited to dig in. Oh, thank you. Okay, so let's talk growing up in Los Angeles. And you're actually from Eagle Rock, is that correct? That's right, yeah. Which is a hipster town now, I'll tell you. It wasn't hipster when I grew up, but uh, we, well, I enjoy, it was an amazing place to grow up. And I'm actually a third generation, actually my grandparents were uh, first moved to Iraq. Wow. So it was very different when they, uh, I think they bought a house in 1950 <laughs> and, um, and then sold the house to my parents. Mm. That's where I grew up. So. That's amazing. And I'm sure it was a little bit more, um, not country at that point, but not as built up as it is now. So it was probably a nice place to live. Yeah. And even when I, when I was growing up, it was, uh, I think it was, I was 11 years old when the 134 freeway was built uh, for those uh, Los Angeles nerds. Yeah. Um, so from my house where I grew up, we could actually go up into the into the mountains mm -hmm. straight out of the backyard my when my father was growing up he had horses in the backyard mm. it was a yeah it was very different so when did when did bass come into the picture for you uh i started playing when i was 11 years old um there was an opening in the uh, elementary school orchestra and uh the openings were for trumpet and bass and my older brother Jim, who's uh, six years older than I am, was already playing in the Eagle Rock High School jazz band. Mm -hmm. And he's a, uh, so since he was a drummer, he wanted someone else in the rhythm section of the family. So he suggested that I start playing acoustic bass. And so I started playing in the orchestra mm -hmm. and I got tired of it pretty fast because all, you know, in elementary school it was only long tones and it was kind of and I, I took a few lessons and first I was excited and then it waned, uh, my excitement for it waned. And then, then uh, when I got into the junior high um, jazz band at, at Eagle Rock High School, then it, it got interesting to me again. Yeah. You know, my role was different and, and um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where I started. And uh, so once it became interesting, were you like into practicing? Were you one of those kids that was like, couldn't pry you away from the bass? Or was it just kind of like this thing you did? Uh, initially, um, it was it was just some, I, I just was really interested in um, in the experience of playing with other people. I, I wasn't mm -hmm. I wasn't immediately drawn to practicing or shedding um, at all. But I got um, kind of very quickly connected with a lot of older musicians that were part of the scene in, in um, Pasadena and Eagle Rock. There was a lot of coffee house kind of things. And by the time I was 13, I started um, playing a few nights a week in a club in, um, in Pasadena mm. and kind of a jam session. And so that really sparked it a lot for me uh, my interest in in um, in learning more about um, about the instrument and about about uh, and and just learning songs because every every week I would kind of be required like the the older musicians mm -hmm. were handing me tapes so I was learning a lot of stuff uh, by ear mm -hmm. and that was initially um, I think what really drew me to the instrument is just the things that I could discover on my own. And so I would listen to um, cassette tapes or LPs over and over and over again until I learned the song. And uh, I didn't really know initially too much about, I, I was 
barely learning to read and, and stuff at that time, but I was learning a lot of songs. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, a, uh, in hindsight, a really great way to, to be introduced to the instrument um, and to, to the language of improvisation. Um, because I really just learned um, by what I was hearing and then trying to, to find ways of playing the things that I was hearing on the instrument. Yeah, and, and it, so, it seems like, especially at that age, to it's very satisfying, especially when you're already going out to play gigs. It's like, I can listen to something, immediately go try it out, as opposed to if you're in an orchestra, you have to wait for that concert, you know, at, at that age too. So it's kind of like, you can work everything out pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I was playing along with recordings. I remember my parents kind of looking down. I had a uh, mono... Um, a little record player and I would play just one side of a, rec of a recording over and over and over again in the dark. <laughs> and my mother would like kind of lean downstairs into the basement. She's like, are you okay? You know, <laughs> do you need anything to eat? Yeah. And I would just, I would just get really, um, and I still see the benefits of doing that, like deep listening to something, um, small moments in music until you really understand it from every angle. Mm -hmm. And it taught me very early on that, that um, to really rely on my ear. Um, the understanding of harmony and the intellectual part of it, um, I learned later mm -hmm. and I filled in as I went along. Um, and initially I could, uh, I could read chord charts. I knew where the notes were. And so I could read chord charts only in that I would see a chord symbol B flat minor seven flat five, I would just see B flat and my mm -hmm. ear would fill in the rest. And that was a great exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I did finally uh, learn um, more about harmony and learning how to read later on, um, I had already gotten so used to relying on my ear. So it was uh, in hindsight, a really great way. Um, it also just, just, uh, connected me or um, made me appreciate the connection that I could get with other people and that listening and responding to someone was the deepest part and the reason why we make music, you know, mm. rather than just like, I have to learn this and I have to learn it perfectly. Um, and then I'm going to perform it and that's going to be it yeah. and my part in it. And I, I really started early on to appreciate that my that what I was doing was just a part of the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And my ability to respond to what was going on was going to be the most important part of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. In the same way that we communicate with, hopefully with language, yeah. uh, with, with uh, the verbal language and written language and, and music is the same to me. Yeah. And I guess also, you know, at that early age, what you enjoyed the interaction, but did you, were you also enjoying the music itself? Cause I know people are like, you know, how do you, you liked jazz as a kid, you know? So did, did you enjoy the music? Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, uh, that was also really important is, you know, growing up in the late seventies when I just, you know, I was starting to play and um, the kind of music that I was interested in was not what what was the popular music around me in in high school, and I was initially just a real jazz snob at eleven <laughs> years old. It was really funny. Um, uh, since then, I've learned to appreciate many different kinds of music, but at that time, it was I I just thought it was some kind of um, I was really interested in, in jazz. I was really interested in, in, um, beat poets or, or anything like that seemed underground or, yeah. or not popular at that time, you know, it was Kerouac and, 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 um, and Charles Mingus and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And, 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 and to me, it, it all just was like a, a cultural thing that was, 
um, fascinating and not like everybody else. Yeah. And that, to me to be really, uh, I was re really drawn to it. Can you remember any of those records that you would play on repeat alone in the basement? The first one that I really feel that, and I use, I share this example a lot, it was um, um, Someday My Prince Will Come, Miles Davis. And it was, and, and side, just side one, when I listened to it, you know, a few hundred times at least in the course of a, a week or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I would just, uh, and then I would, I would, um, try to sit at the piano and, and uh, figure out a little bit of the voicings, play along with, uh, it, it's, it's a, it was a great example of something to work on because everything in it is very clear. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to follow for the most part. You know, some of the cold bits of, of John Coltrane solos are a little, tricky or Hank Mobley and and but you I could kind of play along with those melodies and get the essence of it mm -hmm. and then I it was the first time when I was really aware of there when Miles Davis did this Paul Chambers did this and Jimmy Cobb did this and 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 I saw all the parts together and to me that was um you know that was an early way of even though I didn't, it didn't make its way to, to the page. I didn't, I, I wasn't that advanced mm -hmm. yet, but it was a real, um, it, it was, it was meaningful transcription. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a process that I've followed since because just to learn those baselines wouldn't have been enough. Yeah. Uh, unless you, you know, and I played along with it a ton. So I would get that, you know, that feeling of, you know, what that what that beat felt like yeah and, and i guess too i mean you make a great point you you not every you, you do have to listen to something a hundred a few hundred times mm -hmm. to get that all in because i kind of think about it I, I love like basketball and baseball and it's like if you were to watch for when i watch basketball i can't catch everything in one in what what happens at all at once i'd have to watch it rewatch it rewatch it just to see all the 10 players like what they're all doing so i guess subliminally too at that age you're really learning about like you said where you knew it like interaction and sound as well and then just learning great tunes yeah and with with the basketball analogy analogy not that i'm into sports really but <laughs> i can imagine that you know in the same way as music you're you're trying to imagine what that individual saw when they made the decision yeah pass or to do whatever they did to move in a certain way um so when i listen to music in that way i really want to try and imagine what it's not enough just to f to be able to play what notes charlie parker could play for example mm -hmm. it's why he made those notes when he did and what he was responding to mm -hmm. at the time and as much as possible to try and imagine the entire picture yeah and uh when i'm i you know i always um recommend to students too is is to listen to small moments in music mm -hmm. thoroughly rather than um because we we have so much at our fingertips it's it's um in terms of music and and um shuffle play and we listen yeah. to tons of music which is a great thing to do and you you're exposed to more things and you you get to figure out where your interests lie and where your focus should be but once you decide that focus is required then to take very small moments of music and sometimes it's it's way less than a single song mm -hmm. you know all the way through it's 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 a it's four bars yeah or it's a groove and it's like, how does, you know, what's, so a lot of times I'll listen through and when there's a moment that I don't really understand either rhythmically or I don't feel that I have under my fingers or there's something harmonic going on or melodic thing that I don't really understand, then I just take that one moment of music and I move it into my practice. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, that's really, to me, the essence of, 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 you know, how, how much of my 
learning has continued to yeah. this point, you know, it's still what I do. Yeah, I love that. Um, so when you're growing up in LA, you know, late 70s, uh, I'm just curious which venues were still around because you were back in that, those days, you were able to go out as a kid. So and you were seeing music. Was, is there anything memorable you got to see or, or play? Oh, tons, tons of stuff. Um, Dante's, Carmelo's, uh, uh, those were, let's see, uh, there was a place in Pasadena that I played quite a bit called Dino's. Uh, Lomlet was the, was the place, which was a, uh, uh, a place on a Royal Parkway in Pasadena where I played two nights a week for three years, almost <laughs> one or two nights a week. And, um, in the jam session. So I, I would, I'd play in the house band and, and, um, and then bass players, other bass players would come by and, mm -hmm. uh, other musicians. And so that was an amazing, um, opportunity i also was really lucky to um to get to know monty budwig mm -hmm. who was uh my my teacher from uh for i think when i was 13 to 15 maybe mm -hmm. and uh, monty was amazing and he would take me to a lot of clubs when he was playing or even when he wasn't playing he'd come and you know and his stepson was uh a, a drummer in the high school band with me mm. and uh, Eagle Rock had a, a combination junior high and high school uh, so it was a six-year school so I was mm. able to play in the high school band at, in junior high amazing band director uh, named John Ronaldo who kept the program going even during school cuts and all the stuff mm -hmm. that was going on it was amazing um, but through through Monty and through several other musicians, um, I was able to get into a lot of these clubs, even though they were bars mm -hmm. and um, Dante's. They would sneak me in the back door. I don't even think it was. I don't think it was legal even then. Um, but they'd let me come in the back door and drink Coca Cola and sit mm -hmm. in the back. And so I saw amazing. I mean, from a bass standpoint, I got to see Monty play a lot. Um, Leroy Vinegar. Mm -hmm. Uh, Charlie Hayden, uh, an incredible amount of great stuff. So. Yeah, what a time. What a time because all those musicians, not that they already had their heyday, but they had already been playing for so long. And then they're just accessible almost every night of the week. You know, there was music just, just playing and hanging. Yeah. Oh, that's very yeah, cool. It was an amazing time. Um, so, and you also studied classically, right? Around that age? Um, Monty introduced me to, uh, some things for sure. And, and, uh, the Samandel book and some early, you know, Boeing stuff. And then I play, I did a little bit of, um, let's say real orchestra playing, but, uh, with the, the, I played in the Pasadena city college, uh, a bass section for a little bit in high school and um and a little bit of orchestra playing at eagle rock but not too much uh but when i really started studying more seriously was with fred tinsley who was at cal arts and that, mm -hmm. that when i was 18 i went to to cal arts for four years and then i was able to study with charlie hayden and weekly lessons with fred tinsley at the same mm -hmm. time and that's uh, uh for those who don't know, Fred uh, passed away a couple of years ago, but he was 40 years or so, long time in the uh, Los Angeles Philharmonic. Yeah. An amazing guy, amazing human, and an amazing bassist. And he also was an incredible jazz player. Mm -hmm. So it was a great fit for me because he wasn't trying to prepare. He he knew that it wasn't really my goal to 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 begin auditioning for orchestra mm -hmm. um, after college. But uh, he listened very closely to what I was trying to do and then helped me to, uh, to work on the things that he saw that, that were the unique things in my sound that, mm -hmm. that 
thought that could be helped. And um, he kind of reworked my techno technique mm -hmm. entirely. And and um, and uh, it was an incredible experience. You know, well, when a I lot of, it, a lot of it was about slowing me down and and mm -hmm. uh, using the weight of my body to play the instrument and to, and to um, and really worked a lot on on helping me um, achieve better legato lines and mm -hmm. the things that I was hearing melodically. He was an incredible teacher. Well, I was going to say, like, when I hear you play in any situation, it is clear as day and just com complete clarity is what I hear from you. And that's one of the things that I really love about your playing. And uh, maybe that's something that Fred helped helped you with. Oh, incredibly. Yeah. Uh, and then you throw on Charlie Hayden. What was it like studying with him? Again, someone you saw live for sure before that point, heard on recording. So what what were lessons with him like? Um, they were kind of lesson, non-lessons. Yeah. It could be uh, uh, anybody who knows Charlie might understand what that phrase means. It, it was a lot of... Uh, uh, we a lot of lessons where we would just hang out we'd have coffee experiences where i just ask a lot of questions mm -hmm. because i was uh from the time i was 15 i was really immersed in in a lot of the music that he had been so central in creating um and so i had a, a lot of uh working with Charlie would be just to kind of make sure you had the right things in mind and kind of focused him in on things that you wanted to, uh, he was a very generous guy, but it, he could, you know, it could easily be just anecdotes and, and, mm -hmm. and, and jokes because yeah. he, he had, he loved to tell jokes. And, um, so a lot of it was just focusing it, him in and asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I was, uh, I was really fortunate to be there at that time to be able to have Fred and Charlie mm -hmm. at the same time. I mean, I can't imagine a, a greater situation. And um, so with Fred, it was it was definitely more my physical approach, but also concepts as well and charlie was just concepts yeah to me you know um and and uh much of the things that i the really valuable th experiences that i had with charlie were working in group in um in classes and groups um that he led uh related to a lot of music that he had made mm. and so at that time um he had just made uh, Ballad of the Fallen uh, Liberation Music Orchestra with Carla Blay arrangements that were incredible. Um, Rejoicing had just come out, Pat Metheny and, and Billy Higgins. Um, Song X with Ornette and Pat, Jack DeJanette. Um, and so when he would make this, these records and then he'd come back to Cal Arts and he'd have the sheet music and he'd say, Look, I just did this. Check this out, you know. And and we would make bands that would play. You know, we did concerts with all the music of Song X, mm. you know, where we just you know, and he'd play a few songs, and I'd play a few songs, and we'd play together. And it was that was really amazing because you know. And then he was doing a bunch of stuff with Keith Jarrett. Um, you know those kind of experiences where we're working on that i remember he was working on that composition prism mm -hmm. we didn't know which because keith was playing different changes every time he he came around to a certain section and we're in class and and charlie just picks up the phone and calls him you know and starts asking him questions yeah. about, you know i don't know if we got any answers from it but you know that that experience of just it, um being able to be in, invited into mm -hmm. the process that yeah. deep and then and then get a chance to try it yourself and fail 
and try again and fail. And, you know, and that was an amazing thing about Cal Arts as well, is that we were just constantly making concerts, mm -hmm. making arrangements, uh, writing, playing, and trying stuff. And there was always a space to play it, even if it was uh, in the main gallery at noon, it could yeah. be for more formal concert. It was all kinds. So we were doing concerts constantly. And that rather than, you know, waiting for your senior recital and, yeah. and building up a lot of tension around that, it was just try stuff and then move on. And that to me was the closest thing to actually doing what I do now, mm -hmm. uh, which is just, you know, get together with people, make, you know, create ideas, put it out there, move on to the next idea or rework it and, mm -hmm. and, and continue with the ideas. And, and that's, well, that, that's just such a unique experience to have the person there who recorded it, performed with those people, like, very recently, not, you know, years and years ago, like just to right. ha what a workshop that is. Yeah, I bet maybe did that influence the way you teach at all as well? Absolutely. Um, but it also makes me think that it's just the the importance of taking advantage of the opportunities that you have, mm -hmm. like all the things that we've talked about um, from really early experiences to Cal Arts to when I moved to New York and and um, is that whenever I whenever I've seen something that's a possibility of something that interests me and is also something that I can learn from and take advantage of. Um, I'm, I I want to try and do that. Mm -hmm. And um, when I think and I've had unbelievable opportunities in in that regard, but I don't really think of my experience with um, with uh, with Charlie or or Fred or any of my teachers as really that much different than the people I was able to play with. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned Carmen McRae or or um, Art Farmer or Jim Hall or people, you know, it's it to me it's all it's all the same. It's it's mm -hmm. an opportunity to learn to see how they do things. Yeah. That's what was so great about the experience with Charlie in that in that classroom setting or you know setting up those concerts. You get you're you're invited into the process. Yeah, yeah. And um, and, and when I now I when I'm able to lead my own projects, I'm using little bits and pieces of everybody else's pro process. Yeah, as well. And I guess, you know, on the, the student side or, or the receiving end, it's always like be prepared for any opportunity, but also be open, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, do your best to prepare, but always know that you cannot be fully prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, well, that the, wouldn't be fun, you know, if, if you were just like yeah, perfect yeah. every time. Um, and 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 try to to be as flexible as possible mm -hmm. as well, and to keep your keep your mind and your your ears open mm -hmm. for change because it's always coming. Um, and um, those opportunities that I had um, in the past won't um, won't come in the same form. Mm -hmm. But. I can't get stuck on those opportunities either. I need yeah. to, to, to be aware of what's going on. Now, <laughs> with my contemporaries and the people that, that I'm able to um, um, communicate with and to learn from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's done. The, the past is done, but you learn mm -hmm. from it, keep going. And uh, so I know you were playing a lot at CalArts, like in CalArts and probably still having your same nightly you know, gig routine in the greater LA area. Mm -hmm. But is it, it's true that while you were, you know, still at CalArts, that's when you started with Carmen McRae. Mm -hmm. And how did, how did that happen? I did an audition with her uh, at her house in, I guess it was the beginning of my third year, my junior year at CalArts. 
and um and i just went to her house and uh there were several bass players there and we all stood around and awkwardly played <laughs> with her and i uh she I'm never sorry, even, that must have been scary it was it it's the only thing i think i ever got through an audition and it was one of the most awkward moments yeah in music <laughs> um and uh she never told me that i got the job either i just i think i just received some um back when we had paper plane tickets and and i received a a little itinerary and some tickets in the mail and that was it wow and then i think her manager maybe called me and told me how much i was going to get paid or something like that, that was about it you know it was like and i just showed up wherever you know uh it was supposed to be and uh and cal arts uh the folks at cal arts were amazingly um uh they they were great they they really understood that this was a special circumstance of something an opportunity for me to to take so uh but already i had been like you, you mentioned i had already been playing a lot in los angeles mm -hmm. um most many nights when i was at cal arts so i was already kind of used to being really fragmented and not sleeping enough and yeah showing up for my uh, you know 8 a.m solfeggio class with a large coffee and mm -hmm. just trying to sight sing things and you know I would, but um at that time too when when i first started with carmen she wasn't doing really long tours mm -hmm. occasionally we'd go out for a few weeks and then and then uh, then she would do the summer festivals so it kind of worked you know yeah uh, I guess it kind of worked. It, it, I felt like I was always behind and fragmented and yeah. trying to catch up. But somehow I did finish Cal Arts, and then um, a few weeks after I I graduated, I moved to New York mm -hmm. uh, because I was able to you know continue working with Carmen McRae um, because it didn't really matter where I lived. Yeah with her you know we played as much on the east coast as the west coast and and a fair amount in europe so um i used that opportunity to to move to new york and have a little bit of income mm -hmm. you know touring stuff but coincidentally around that time um she started to work a lot more and then also doing stuff with with dizzy gillespie and uh uh clifford jordan mm -hmm. John Collins. And so I was able to meet the, you know, play with those musicians as well and, and then do other projects and tours with them. Yeah. So it kind of opened a lot of doors. And then when I moved to New York, uh, through my, through Charlie, um, he connected me with Pat Metheny and, um, and then Pat connected me with Jim Hall. And you know, it kind of built that way. And again, it's it's about like opportunities and things like you know, um, and and just being as ready as you can and available to mm -hmm. to take advantage of those things. Yeah. Um, and and also, I sh I should say parenthetically uh, <laughs> that that what I just described make it seem like I was just going from one thing to the next to the next. Mm -hmm. and I, was, I was super busy and, and everything was fine. And, and it was my first years in New York were very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it felt like at the time. Yeah. You know, and, and I lived on very, you know, I uh, <clears throat> tried to keep my cost of living way down mm -hmm. so that I could and, and um, um, so that I could uh, play more of the music that I wanted to play. Yeah. Um, but I did a lot of different, uh, you know, a lot of playing in hotel lobbies and mm -hmm. old things and and um, weddings and bar mitzvahs and things like that. So I don't want to make it seem like it was just like, you know, I just went. Well, and there's something to learn from those playing situations too. Absolutely. 
and 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 very important again to look at the opportunities when you're doing something like that what is it that i can learn from this situation yeah. rather than just tuning out your mm -hmm. brain and just trying to play on autopilot yeah um, because the only thing that that teaches you is to play on autopilot yeah. or to not be fully present mm -hmm. um so but the the idea of, of the th of just trying to create an opening and be um and not to be pushy but to mm -hmm. be a, available yeah for um uh, for those opportunities when they come mm -hmm. exactly uh, i just want to circle back really quick to mm -hmm. mcrae so that was probably your first road experience even though you were used to being sleepy all the time and overworked and tired um but was it one of those experiences where the the band helped you out like they showed you the ropes or you were you were just on your own um i got a lot of great help yeah uh the the pianist who helped me get the audition was george gaffney who was an amazing pianist and arranger in los angeles and um and he george was a was a real character too very eccentric guy and um he had a lot of great advice for me mm -hmm. and uh and um so yeah i did i did have some good advice from from the other musicians uh mark yeah, it's, a, it's a whole different it's a different world yeah 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 and uh, i unfortunately you know Growing up, I had some experience playing with different vocalists and stuff like that, and I had played a lot of standards. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had some some foundation for for doing uh, for some of the tools that were needed to to play with Carmen. But yeah. um, um, what I learned from her, you know her ability to play ballads and and of of her incredible time mm -hmm. sense which if you listen to her accompany herself that was a great lesson is you know she would finish most sets playing at least a few songs alone at the piano mm. and i would just i would just uh stay at my spot in the crook of the piano so that i could experience that mm she you know because she she could phrase vocally you know so far ahead or behind mm -hmm. when she was uh when she was singing but her piano playing was always so really centered mm. in the time it was it's amazing to to listen to her and that taught me a lot about how to accompany her hmm. yeah and, uh, you know um not to follow that uh knowing when to follow the phrasing when there's rubato sections and things like that but once you've established a time from a from a bass standpoint is is really maintaining that center mm -hmm. so that she had something um to, to sing off of yeah you know and that taught me a lot about how to do that mm. wow what an experience. Did you guys record? Yeah. Um, there's some live recordings. Um, and then one, I, th my first experience, the first time I went to New York, I think, um, I had been to New York to visit before, but as you know, I think we did a, f a week or two at the Blue Note and we made a record called Any Old Time. I think it was called um that was with clifford jordan and um uh, and john collins um uh, mark police was on drums and uh uh eric gunnison was the pianist and we recorded at clinton in midtown and it was like i was so nervous it was <laughs> just a, this amazing yeah. experience to be you know but just to be in new york and you know yeah and we were we were going out to, uh, you know, here and, you know, I would play 
a couple sets with her at the Blue Note and then go to two or three clubs after that. You know, Bradley's yeah. was still active at that time and the Village Gate and all these places. So it was amazing. Mm. And all the while, like this this time, is your family back in Eagle Rock supportive of you? Yeah. Oh, my, my parents were amazingly supportive, but um, very confused. Uh, my, my, they had a mantra kind of that was like always, you know, this is great, but find something to fall back on. Um, which from their perspective is completely understandable. And, yeah. and, and, and as a father now of a 19 year old who's in college, I, man, I can't imagine the stuff that I put my parents through because I just wanted to play yeah. and travel around and hang out and, and, and be a part of, of the, the culture of, of improvised music and, and, and there, they didn't have any perspective for that. You know, my father was a machinist. My mother was a, a school teacher, first grade school teacher. And, and so when I, I, I remember when it was, uh, when I got a, the scholarship to go to Cal arts, um, that was when they, they got a little less pushy on the, mm -hmm. you know, they, they were like, wow, somebody's going to give you a, a chance to go to school to study this thing. Um, but even up until my mother passed a couple of years ago, and even, um, you know, with the amount of touring that I've done this last 30 years or so, she would, I'd would still talk to her on the phone and she'd be like, Oh, honey, where are you? I said, well, mom, I'm in, I don't know, you know, Oslo. Yeah. Said, Oslo in Norway, you know, it'd be like yeah. that. She said, and well, what are you doing there? I said, well, I'm doing a concert and then I'm going to record something or, you know, whatever I yeah. tell her. And, and so who, somebody's, you know, she was still yeah. just like, somebody is paying you to go to know who paid for your flight. I said, well, the promoter paid for me, you know, something like that, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and in my house too, it's, it's really funny. Cause it, um, uh, so they, uh, they've also seen, because my, my wife also is a, is, has a music management company and, and is my manager and, and, so it's a real family business. Mm -hmm. And my mom really appreciated that, but it was still really baffling to her. She yeah. was like, constantly, but, but they were very supportive. Well, and I think that's, that's a reality. You know, a lot of people don't understand how it works. I don't understand. I, it's, it's the, it's a, it's the strangest way to make a living. If you yeah. Think it. <laughs> it's, it's really, but you know, like if you're I on still a, think it's baffling, but sometimes there's those nice moments like maybe you're on a long flight to japan and you're just kind of like wow i can't believe someone's paying me to fly here and do this and, and that it's it's a very uh it's very strange but it's rewarding at the same time but still very weird yeah and it's 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 odd in the same way the music is it's it's a relate it's a it's a business based on relationships mm -hmm. and trust and it's 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 a very odd thing to me i still you know after all these years think it's you know um a very unique way to to try and exist yeah yeah every day every day is different every experience is different mm -hmm. and um you know speaking of experiences i don't want to take up too much more of your time but i kind of want to like fill in those gaps from carmen mccray to now and uh You've been a part of a lot of groups, which is not so common anymore. Like, you know, way back in the day, people would go through Art Blakey, Horace Silver, you, you know, actual groups, and you would you would grow up that way. Uh, but you kind of did that in your own way, being a part of different groups with Pat Metheny, Herbie Hancock, and then that, um, like, was it New, New, Directions? New Directions? I did a music. little bit of, yeah, uh, but just maybe six weeks tour I think and yeah I didn't do a lot with New Directions but a lot with Herbie uh for four or five years and um yeah I've been really lucky to play uh, Andrew Hill mm -hmm. uh, yeah long uh, a lot of touring with Andrew and Jim Hall mm -hmm. and yeah 
So, so uh, I guess maybe you could talk, choose a few to talk about, because like I said, being being in a group nowadays doesn't really exist. It's like you get people together for a record, you put out the record, and then you tour with a different group. That's kind of seems to be like a, a common thread these days. But what does it feel like to be a part of a group? Um, I don't know, with Herbie Hancock or Jim Hall or how does that feel? You know, working with those specific leaders. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing to build and to, to build those relationships and to, um, like we said before, being in, uh, being in a position of working in someone's band who's established, uh, and a real master and has a very unique perspective. You know, Andrew Hill would, you know, the difference between Andrew Hill and Jim Hall and Herbie and, um, the, the, you know, the, just being able to see their process mm -hmm. and how they, uh, how they interact and when they decide to say something and when they decide to s stand back and, and let you, um, succeed or fail on your own you know yeah actually that would be one very similar thing between those three people actually hmm. is that they're very patient and and um to to allow you to f to give you time to find your own space within the music to find your own um way to approach it and they're not expecting you to play it like anyone else and that was a big um lesson for me to learn um early on and that and that was even true back with carmen mccray too is is that thing of going well you know the realization that i'm there to to do what i do mm -hmm. what i can bring to it there's much more that i can learn obviously and mm -hmm. still that's the case for sure uh, but that they didn't hire me to play like so-and-so who did the music before, yeah. which, which is a big challenge when you're playing with somebody whose music you listened to since you were 11 years old. Yeah. yeah. And that's, um, um, there's a lot less pressure when I play with, with friends, my own age that I tour with now, you know, yeah. uh, you know, with like Chris Potter or, or, um, uh, Josh Redman or Brian Blade or different musicians that I play with a lot now, they're my age group and I've and I've grown up with them and we've mm -hmm. kind of grown up together musically. Um, but that thing of being able to play in a band and and build those relationships and then maybe you put those projects aside for a little while, but then you you know. Being able to come back to those, to new projects with mm -hmm. those those individuals again, and see how whatever their experiences they've had and whatever other experiences you've had, and you can bring them together again. So, that's been an amazing thing over the last you know, through my career is being able to revisit those mm. things with people, and then and then still have the memories of of things that I, um, you know. Mm -hmm from the individuals that aren't with us anymore, you know, Andrew and, and Jim, for example, you know, I'm constantly hearing their, their voice and, 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 and recalling things that, that are helpful to me mm. in life and in music now. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And I think there's something so valuable too, when you're playing, touring, you know, night after night to get to, in a way, like have another chance, right? To to play something when you're when you're in a group, you know, you always want to do better. Or there's that, or there's that elusive, like, oh man, last night was was so great. I don't know. Have you ever had that experience? And you you try and do that again, and it it doesn't work. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> but the, you know, that's that's an important lesson too. Is that those preconceptions 
of you know something that works really well on a particular night can become formula and then that can be just as much a block to uh to you learning something new um as anything else you know if you rely on that thing to get house for example and yeah, you know, yeah. like and um that's when i think of you know people that really challenge those preconceptions really amazingly andrew hill is the mm -hmm. prime example of that which is if he saw something like that happening again from the night before he would just do something to just change the narrative yeah. like i'm going over here we're starting at letter c whatever you thought you know mm -hmm. this the song might have a particular form and he's gonna it he, because um yeah he's definitely the greatest example of that because uh, you know, he he was more concerned with you being present mm -hmm. and us having a real conversation musically than it being polished or or uh yeah. Yeah. That, that that you would you would be that you would create something that's absolutely only for this moment. Yeah. And um and it's not to say that that different bands operate in different ways and, mm -hmm. and they, there's thematic things that that can um, add power to the music for sure. Mm -hmm. Knowing when those things, when when to uh, when to grab onto those things and when to let them go. Yeah, that's that's an important thing. And like you said, you have to be present, mm -hmm. and listening to to hear when that's happening. Absolutely. Um, so I just want to kind of end with your music and your recording as a leader and um, how that started happening. I know you're a, a prolific writer and um, am I right? You have 11, 11 um, titles out under your name or maybe some are, are like duo. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. No, that, that's amazing. So when did, why did that start happening? You know, you're playing with all these other people and then you kind of decide, okay, I'm going to put something out myself. Um, around the second or third year that I moved to New York, um, I started playing with a lot of, um, uh, my musicians of my age and, and, and kind of workshopping music. Um, David Binney was one, um, uh, Chris Potter, Donnie McCaslin, um and so from those experience we we would we would just play a lot if 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 we didn't a lot you know we didn't have too many gigs locally and so we would just play a lot together and ex um that's when i really started probably writing more mm -hmm. and getting into the process uh because in the beginning and when i was at cal arts a lot a lot of my writing was my attempts were where I was really concerned and, and with, with getting it perfect somehow mm -hmm. and being, it was too precious. It was like, and, um, I needed the experience of, of now Cal arts offered that for sure. But, but when I, when I was in these situations of just doing sessions with, with these friends of mine, contemporaries and, people that I was playing with um I just I uh I would see how they would just bring in sketches mm -hmm. here's a bass line here's a chord sequence here's here's a little melody thing here's eight bars of this let's see where this goes and I started to really do that uh myself and that really helped to to help me just to see it in the same way that I it, uh, I approach improvisation, mm -hmm. just as like, I'm going to put this out there and see what happens. Yeah. Like realizing like you don't have to have a finished product. Yeah. I, yeah. I had a real block in that way. Like I have to, it, like when I bring it to somebody on paper, <laughs> like I had a very different relationship with improvisation than I had with, with written, the written page. Mm -hmm. 
So this experience of playing with Dave and, and Donnie and, and Chris and, and these different musicians, uh, Bill Stewart, Kenny Wallace and Brian Blade. And, you know, it was just that more of a thing where it's like, here, try this. Yeah. And, that they, and that having friends that would go, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Want to do this, you know? And then, then they'd say, well, maybe you could go from here. Maybe it would be cool to put this next to that or you know suggestions that it would make or just things that would evolve from trying the idea and then i just started doing more of that and that kind of opened up a lot more possibilities for me and, yeah. make, and it was all in my mind of you know whether you know and now i really approach writing as like even after it's recorded even when i'm on the road after three weeks on the road, it's still not done. Mm -hmm. You know, the record could be out yeah. <laughs> and, I'm, yeah. and I'm already changing the song. You know what I mean? It's, it's not, it's not this thing that you finish and you put in a frame and place on the wall. It's never that way. Oh yeah. Which is the great thing about music in general, but it's the constant movement of this thing. And, and, and when I revisit songs that I wrote 10 or more years ago, I never approach them the same way anyway. Mm -hmm. And I'll, and sometimes I'll discard tons of the writing and, and just be, or, or add things or, or change them. So that has helped me a lot. Well, yeah, like, like you said, going, you know, revisiting, with Herbie Hancock or if you've had some time away from some people you've all had some experiences you know different musical experiences so letting that influence what you've already written and being okay with that right and it's also been very important for me to write like I only really write for individuals mm -hmm. and it, so if I can hear someone's sound when I'm writing that helps a lot and then mm -hmm. when I've written something for someone i really try not to say very much about how they interpret it mm -hmm. and really deciding, you know, less is more in terms of verbally or telling them how, if I've wrote, if I wrote the music for them and they approach it in a different way than I imagined, it's almost always better. Yeah. <laughs> and if I say less, I mean, sometimes, you know, knowing when to say just something that could focus a band mm -hmm. is, is an important skill but yeah. generally i find that people say too much and if i'm creating music that's based around improvisation then it's really important not to say too much mm -hmm. so being very careful like how or, or, or thoughtful i should say yeah. how how i'll respond to different individuals when i'm presenting a piece of music to a band yeah it's like right like if you were to write a movie or a scene for a certain actor and they change it up a little bit but that's that's who you wrote it for right and i've seen through you know being in so many different circumstances someone with will make a statement and suddenly the entire band just goes oh that's what's important and then all of uh, all this other stuff all this great opportunities and interaction can disappear. I've seen that happen a lot. And mm -hmm. so kind of, you know, because everybody then is fixated on this single, um, you know, some, even if somebody just says it's like this, yeah, you know, then everyone's got that thought. Everybody goes, okay, the, all these other possibilities, uh, you, you want to make sure that, 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 that all these, uh, these great surprises that can come to you if you've written some music and you present it to someone that you can see the things that come out um, that are unique to the individuals that are playing your music mm -hmm. and not to you know and and you've we've all seen it when you change one member of a band yeah and then suddenly these preconceptions everything changes and it's like but it's important to step back and go, well, what unique things does that person have to bring to this? Mm -hmm. And trying to, to accept that and still give them help and guidance yeah. forward in the music. So 
it's an interesting process. For yeah. Sure. And I like too that going back to like changing music you've already written because I remember the first time I heard um, like a, like a, either a bootleg or a live Thad Jones Mel Lewis thing and I was like whoa that was a different background you know on Don't Get Sassy or something I was like they they can change you know you can change things after they're written mm -hmm. and just having this complete you know freedom revelation like like you're saying even once something's recorded even on paper it's not done it's there's still more life to it right yeah, yeah. Well, I'll be happy to uh, go to one of your concerts when, when that can happen and then hear all the different possibilities. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I'll, I'll put all the links to all your, your records and everything, but I, I was just listening to your, your most recent album, Angular Blues. And again, I, I just, I love your sound and your clarity. And for the super bass nerds out there, um, would you mind telling us your bass setup? Oh, um, well, I, I should say, first of all, that's definitely Wolfgang Neuspiel's recording. Like he okay. conceived the, the group and put it together and, and, um, and I'm very much looking forward to touring with that. We've had a lot of stuff canceled relative to that because that came out just around the time the pandemic hit and and uh, a lot was shut down but and we did that recording in tokyo we did um three or four days at the cotton club in tokyo and then we just went in the studio for one day to make that record um and so it went by very quick quickly but um in terms of setup um what specifically i get like for a live performance because i i am not a gearhead i'm not a bass nerd i just stick a mic you know re20 is cool by me so what like for a live like you know like a trio performance a live performance um generally i use this uh a shep cmc6 um microphone with a hypercardioid um capsule to nerd out uh <laughs> and i run that through a grace um, a Grace Felix preamp. So the Grace, a company in Colorado, Evan Grace is a great, uh, great preamp. And I run that uh, also with a realist, um, David Gage realist pickup. And I blend the two using most of the time, primarily the microphone. Mm -hmm. And depending on the volume of the band and, and, um, and the setup, um, and how much isolation I can have. Mm -hmm. It's more of the mic. And um, I use pyrostro strings. Um, uh, what do I use? Is that how you pronounce it? <clears throat> I think so. That was very fancy, Scott. Pyrostro? Yeah. Is that not how you say it? I, I don't know. I, I always say pyrostro. Rastra. But I liked the way you said it. It was very elegant. Wow. Okay. That's something I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get, I'm going to follow that up and find out. Yeah, please do. Um, yeah, I use their Eva Parazzi strings. And then sometimes I use the, the, um, uh, olive string on the G. I do too. Cause it's a little bit thicker. Yeah. And it gives you something to work with under your fingers and, yeah. and uh, so that's that's pretty much what I do. So then I I run it through a um, monitor generally. Mm -hmm. I prefer monitors to amplifiers, but then if I'm playing louder, I'll also supplement it with an amplifier as well mm -hmm. on larger stage situations. And so. Okay, so that's the nerd the nerd out session. And then uh, do you have anything that you're uh, working on or that we should look out for coming up? Um, I have things in mind to record, but uh, nothing's been solidified and, and things. I've spent much of the last months kind of, it, it's been an interesting time for me to develop a lot of stuff on the instrument that I haven't had time to think about. Mm -hmm. So a lot of thumb position things, again, nerding out just and different ways of approaching 
um, the instrument um, and it's it's really amazing to have the you know time to play for three or four hours a day just discovering things on the instrument because mm -hmm. I've, I've always been in the position of you know kind of building towards whatever the next project was um so i'm 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 working on um some ideas of uh, creating in uh, a few new recording recording projects um a series of uh, duo recordings with uh, different saxophone players uh, that I'm kind of writing for. And uh, I'm uh, mixing a project with, um, with a band called Steel House, which is Edward Simon and Brian Blade. And I, we recorded something in November of last year. Um, and so we're just mixing that now mm. and adding a lot of overdubs remotely. Oh, cool. uh, so hopefully we'll have that finished and out in the next few months, I think. Because you guys, you guys already have a recording together. Yeah, this is yeah. the second recording. Okay, cool. And um, and we have plans to tour if 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 it works out. Um, next, uh, perhaps again in California. Um, in the fall, if it works, and uh, we'll see. So, but it. The, so I'm always, you know, I mean, I'm writing stuff and I'm, and I'm thinking about projects and that'll be um, possible once things open up and, and revisiting other projects. Um, but the main thing that's been really interesting through all this is having the time to really, you know, each day uh, explore things um, on the instrument that, mm -hmm. that are, that are, unique and I, I i see a lot of change coming which is really interesting hmm. that that just having the time to really explore ways of you know i'm discovering more things about the instrument which mm -hmm. is really amazing to me yeah, How isn't much, that you've been playing it for you know over 30 years. new ways to you change the way you finger something or you change the way you approach a, a physical aspect of playing the acoustic bass and suddenly your ideas open up into a whole other direction mm -hmm. so that's been really interesting I'm, I'm hoping to follow that thread until yeah well i'm glad you're doing that because you're going to have so much to offer when you play with other people i hope so <laughs> well scott that's it i'm not going to take any more of your time <laughs> but this has really been uh, really really a pleasure so great to meet you and thanks for sharing. Well, thank you, Katie. I really appreciate you um, giving me a chance to talk with you. It's been great. Yeah, and well, I hope hopefully you get to come to California. I'll be there. Absolutely. As soon as we can. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Scott. Uh, continue to be well. And um, again, really thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. Take care.